I will call the um, regular meeting of Irmo Town Council to order, and I will recognize uh, Councilwoman Condom to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Father in heaven, we ask for your blessings tonight that we may make the right decision for our people, for our town, of which we're so proud, and we should be. We've been blessed with many things, all good, and whatever problems we have, give us the wisdom to overcome them. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, next item on the agenda is the reading of the minutes for August the 5th. Is there a motion for the minutes as, uh, as written? So moved. Second. 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 Any uh, discussion? No, but it was a lot of them. I read the whole thing. <laughs> All in favor then of the minutes uh, being approved as, as written, uh, do so with a short hand. Next item is administrative briefing. Mr. Brown, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, so just two things. Uh, reminder that Summer Relief Music Festival is this Saturday from two days, and the town audit begins next week. The town what? Audit. Okay. Yep, so. And um, just for record on that Saturday thing, um, what's his name? Jeremiah said. If we could be there, any of us can be there, want to be there at 2 o'clock when they start, then he's going to ask us to come up and do a welcome or something like that. So They're not going to pour ice over our head, are they? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. <laughs> and if you can't be there at 2 and you can come later, just mention to him and he can bring you up later too or something. I think it's um, Any questions of Mr. Brown in the brief? Now this was short. Yes. One page. Yes. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Next item on the agenda is receipted communications, and um, I had a couple. I think I might have heard Harvey has one too. Um, we had a I can't find it now, but there was a letter in the Vermont News State newspaper yesterday about the 911. Um, I had called um, Johnny Dilko on it to ask him some questions about. I think he had mentioned maybe they were going to get all the municipalities to start their own and some other stuff. So I called him to ask him some stuff to kind of verify um, all that. And he couldn't be here. Um, and plus he said he probably wouldn't be able to answer our questions. Um, so he asked um, if David Kerr with public safety and also Nikki Rogers with the 911 could come instead. And I said, well, fine, they can come and kind of tell us a little bit. Because I did have some questions about this and just trying to figure out, but if y'all want to step up here and then um, but I know it said in there that y'all were just going to tell the people that have theirs now that they were going to have to pay for theirs, I guess, in full, but you're not really going to be making municipalities take it over. But just kind of fill us in on that. That is an absolutely true statement, what you just said, and it's not making the municipalities do anything. Traditionally, what we've done is since 1993, when the original plan was written for the county, and then it was amended in 1994, all CMRS funds and 911 tariffs, all the funds that are received from the state come to Lexington County. And then Lexington County had the responsibility of managing all four PSAPs within the county. Um, that, of course, over time, with additional duties, with growth, with where we are today, we can no longer continue to do that. Um, so that's really what the, the new 911 plan addresses. It basically gives those funds to the municipalities who wish to maintain their own PSAP and gives them the ability to manage their own PSAP, manage their own funds, and, and do everything it takes to run a 911 center. And PSAP is a public safety answering point. Okay. But y'all would not be assisting anymore in the... Okay. Right. Um, and, and some of the questions I had, and I wasn't real sure, but it said it cost the county 90000 Is that 90000 per municipality? Per, per PSAP. And uh, Ms. Rogers, she is the one that manages all the accounts um, for the reimbursable funds, but also all the procurement actions that go out 
all the service contracts, all the agreements and everything. And the estimate and actually using real data, data it takes somewhere between 85 and 90,000 depending on the PSAP just for service contracts and training and things of that nature. That speaks nothing to new equipment or to uh, other requirements. Uh, also does not speak to radios, does not speak to hiring dispatchers, uh, anything of that nature. And it said in here, I think West Columbia gives you, I guess, or chips in and gives y'all or keeps it, I'm not sure, but 27000 in case it kept seven. Is that the amount of money that they get from their I'm not sure exactly oh, yeah. where those numbers came from, um, okay. they, but I, I will say that the, the number, the amount of money that the county receives through reimbursements or, or correction through the 911 tariffs is less than it costs to run a PSAP. And that's for the whole county or just for the municipality? For the, for the municipal PSAPs. Those that, okay. uh, you got to understand how a PSAP is set up. Um, a, Public safety answering point is, you can imagine it's a, a, a force field around that municipality, a barrier. All the landlines within that jurisdiction are sent to that 911 center. Of course, when you get into wireless calls, and Ms. Rogers can talk about some of the complexities of wireless calls, um, wireless calls do not honor that boundary around PSAPs, around municipalities. And that's where a lot of these complications come in with people going to, or a call being routed to a, a different PSAP than they thought it was going to go to. Um, so that's, th there are challenges associated with that. But a PSAP is just a, a um, all the landlines and addresses within that municipality um, are considered that municipality's uh, addresses for, for PSAPs, for uh, response. That's how it's set up. Um, that's the old technology, right? I mean, that's the technology I've been following since 1992. Correct. Is that correct? Um, think of your, um, your public safety answering point is um, the first point of contact for that emergency call. Right. Your landline phones are your old-timey, hardwired, you know, telephone right. at your house where you just pick up the phone and it's already, you know, in the, um, in the wall. As technology and, you know, um, everything evolves, um, people are going away from those um, landline phones to save money or just because they're going to use their cell phone and their cell phone is with them all the time. So what has happened over the past years is you've seen, or we have seen the, the um, income from the 50 cents per line um, for the landline phones decrease. Yeah, sure. However, the cell phone money increases. But the, um, the cell phone money is received a little bit differently than the landline phone. The um, landline phones, the telephone companies mail that each month or each quarter directly to the county. And we you know, deposit that and we use that to pay for those 911 service charges, the equipment, <coughs> um, maintenance plans, that kind of thing. The wireless money, once a quarter, um, I get, um, I have to report to the state how many cell phone calls our 911 center receives, how many cell phones Casey receives, how many cell phone calls West Columbia receives, and how many cell phone calls Batesburg leaves, uh, I mean receives. We add those up and we submit them. There is a, um, all the cell phone companies submit their um, money directly to the state. So once the state has all the cell phone money, they get every county, every piece app to report their um, um, cell phone numbers to them. And then they divide that money up. Um, they keep a portion of it and then each um, county gets um, a percentage based on how many cell phone calls they answer. <coughs> So one month you could get you know, a little bit more, and next month you could get a little bit less. It just depends on how many cell phone companies and how many cell phones um, you answer. And that is how it's set up based on the plan that was written in 1993. The old plan in 1993 when you had the direct lines, the state didn't get a cut of that money? Um, I'm sure they did if there was cell phone money. No, no, the direct okay. line hardwired, the state the hard, got a cut of that money? All of the hardwired um, lines come directly to the county or the um, however, your county was set up right. to run the PSAPs. That's because Whenever you can identify the, you can identify that this house right. is making this 911 call and you had the direct line right. number. When we get a landline phone, that um, 911 screen shows exactly the address. Mm -hmm. You know, it shows exactly who that phone is registered to. Right. It gives us the telephone number so we can call it back if we get disconnected. 
it gives the date, the time of the call, um, and it also gives um, what jurisdiction it is, whether it's um, you know, Irma Police, um, what EMS unit is the primary unit, and um, what fire jurisdiction. All right, that's old school technology. So now what is your new school, what is your new technology with the cell phones? How do y'all handle that? Cell phone calls come in, mm -hmm. and with, there's three different types of cell phones. The first type of cell phone is we get absolutely nothing except for the date and the time. It says query caller for location. You don't get a name, you don't get an address, you don't get a GPS location, right. you, you don't, don't get anything. Right. So it's all up to the call taker to be able to question and interrogate that caller to find out where they're at. The second kind of call is what you call your phase one wireless. They kind of phase these different things in. The first phase one gave us the location of the tower that they are hitting. We have received calls and we continue to receive calls from Georgia, from Sumter, from all over. It depends on how many slots your carrier, if you have Verizon, if you have Sprint, if you have T-Mobile, whatever, and you dial 911, it's going to try to reach the first tower that your carrier has a slot on. If they've got 10 slots and they're 10 people using the T-Mobile slots, then it's going to bounce you to another tower. So it depends on how large and how much coverage and all those things that your cell carrier has. Eventually, you'll get to um, um, a 911 center. It may or may not be the closest one to you. <laughs> so we still, as a call taker, have to interrogate that caller, find out where they're at, and that's why we do public education to try to encourage people be aware of your surroundings. Okay. So the tower location really doesn't do us any good. I mean, it, it, the tower, we can find out what tower you're hitting, but that was it. Um, now the second phase of wireless um, calls, we get your GPS location. As long as we have a connection to you, if that call gets dropped, if you go through the drop zone, if you, you know, accidentally um, hang up or you can't talk, we lose that connection all together. We have a button on our 911 system, it's called a rebid button. And on those cellular calls, we have to rebid or retransmit for that location and it will give us the GPS coordinates of that caller within a 500 yard radius of a pinpoint. So it could be around, it, it'll give us about a block radius. So as long as we've got a connection with that caller, we can still interrogate him or her and say, what is your location? What is the problem? And get that information. Um, and also on those phase two calls, we do get the callback number. On the phase one and the, um, the first one, we do not. So if wireless technology, even though they show on TV that you know you can you can do the GPS tracking on your kids and you can find out where they're at and all that kind of stuff, they haven't provided that to the 911 community yet. So we keep pushing that on a um, you know state and national level that these uh, cellular companies need to give us the 911 community the ability to have that location. It is still not there yet. I take that from what you said as well the hard line system, the old mobile. Right. That you get 50 cents per phone line. Correct. Whether it's used or not. Correct. But on the cellular side, you only garner money is if they use it to make a call. No, not quite. Um, everybody still has to pay that on their, if you look on your cell phone. I know I pay it on my cell phone bill. And just like the landlines, the cell companies have to submit that 50 cents per month per line to the state. However, um, the state, the way they disperse the funds is each county or each piece that gets paid a portion of the cell phone um, money by how many calls, how many cell phone calls we process. In other words, if they had none in Batesburg, Leesville, then they would get no money. Right. Typically, when you're close to an interstate, and we have I-26, we have I-20, we have 77, we are going to get a lot of cellular calls. Um, yeah. But I will tell you, just nationally, and even um, I, would, I would imagine through um, uh, Casey West Columbia and Batesburg, they have seen um, their cell phone, phone calls increase. We, most of our um, calls are set cell phone. We take about 80 or 90% cell phones instead of 
landline. And what complicates it even more, and we've actually looked into a call before for Chief, Chief Buck, is when people use VoIP technology, the voice over IP through your computer. Right. We had a particular call where the, the caller was calling from a VoIP device, but had not re-registered their address to their current address. So the address that was in the system was three addresses ago. And that complicates, so it's important for all residents to understand, landlines are the only way that a 911 center is gonna know exactly where you are. Um, I think in that article two, I think it said y'all had about 353,000 calls a year. Um, and 94% of that came from, say, the county. Um, but about three and a half came from West Columbia, and 2% came from um, Casey which if I did my math correctly, that would mean uh, 19 calls a day came from Casey and 34 calls a day came from West Columbia Casey. Um, we track them by, the, by monthly. We get a monthly report from Casey and West well, Columbia. And, and it said about 7,000. That would equate to about 7,000 for Casey and about mm -hmm. like 12,000 something for West Columbia. It's not me. Um, and I guess from what I'm reading in Article 2, it said that, and one of the things, it said that I think uh, some of these municipalities, the dispatchers usually perform clerical tasks as well. And we, and we can't speak to any of that. That's, so that's really a municipality. Doing else other than, because that 19 or whatever would be less than one call an hour a day, I guess. Um, yeah, and the, and the funds that Nikki had spoken of, Ms. Rogers had spoken about, um, can't be used to hire dispatchers. I think that's an important fact to understand also. There are only certain things for legis bill. legislation that it can be used for. That's the money on your bill that comes in. So who pays the, for the landline and the tariff funds. Who pays for the dispatchers? They keep the county general funds. Or the currently on or the municipality if they're doing it? Yes, right. But right um, now you are subsidizing, but you're not going to anymore, is that? The new 911 plan um, basically turns over all control of the PSAP to the current jurisdictions that are running PSAPs. Okay. Now, we want to start on, are you saying we couldn't or we could, but we'd just... Service-wise to the citizens, um, and I've spoken quite a bit to uh, Chief Buck and to Chief Sonnefeld, and um, it is very costly. Right. It is very costly, especially to start up, and I can't give you any estimates as costs. I know Chief Buck is doing his own independent research to determine costs associated with actually doing the construction, installing the equipment, um, all of those things, hiring the number of dispatchers, because here's an issue. If you're in a dispatch center with one dispatcher, Okay, a call comes in, a 911 call. It's a long-term call where you've got someone with a perpetrator in their home, and you're keeping the individual on the line for an extended period of time trying to calm them, trying to soothe them, and try to let them know that they're not alone. Um, another 911 call comes in. Who's answering it? So, so we have 40 dispatchers currently, um, 10 authorized per shift in the county 911 center. And somebody, I think, that told me, it, it, I don't know this, but the law required two per shift. Is that correct, or is that? I don't know of any law like that. Oh, okay. Your primary responsibility as a PSAP should be answering 911 calls. Right. Um, and it takes a lot, especially when you have to keep those callers on the line for an extended period of time because you can't get off the phone with them if they're having um, certain kinds of, kinds of, if they're having a home invasion or if they're, you know, armed robbery, that kind of thing, you're not supposed to let those um, telephone callers off the line. And so then you've got other responsibilities that have to be attended to. And let me tell you another challenge, especially for, um, for Irmo, is for instance, county is a countywide EMS service, okay? So county dispatches for EMS, countywide. Um, we also currently dispatch for your police and your fire um, departments, okay? A call comes in, okay? Let's say it's a call that requires multiple disciplines to respond to it. When that call comes in and that call taker is taking that information, every dispatcher that dispatches for those disciplines is seeing that information at the same time, okay? So you can spontaneously dispatch multiple resources at the same time. Okay, now take for instance a situation where you break off and have a police department dispatching. They get a 911 call into their PSAP from a landline. Okay, the caller talks to them, but it, let's say it's a shooting. 
Okay? That police agency is going to take all the information that they absolutely need to respond to their police officers so they can safely respond their police officers because they're not going to want to send them in a difficult, dangerous situation. So they need all the pieces of information. How long does that take? Uh, it's a rhetorical question. Now they have to go transfer them to EMS. The EMS called to the county. The EMS call taking process, we have a goal. We manage by objectives in Lexington County. The goal is that all calls are answered within 10 seconds, okay? And that all EMS resources are dispatched within one minute, okay? We don't meet that goal, but we're striving for it. We're continuing to strive, okay? So that's one minute of call, talking to the citizen, getting an uh, ambulance out. The ambulance crews have a minute to get to the truck, okay? So five minutes could have passed. And that's five minutes further from an EMS crew hitting the ground to that resident who's in need. So every time you add a step, it increases the time it takes to get the resources that we need to get on the ground. Does anybody else have any more questions? I have one. Um, I'm sure you all are fine people, and I'm sure you endeavor to do good jobs. But you have to know, we get complaints fairly regularly that the 9-11 calls aren't answered, people don't know any landmarks, which that's understandable. They don't know where Irmo's Kroger is. They, they've probably never been here, so, and the people in the parking lot don't know the address when they're calling. I mean, it's fraught with difficulty. And we had one situation where we had a child hurt in our park, and that was bad. That, that brought out all of the things you face, and we faced them with you because no one knew where the park was. So, anyway, I just realized, you know, we hear it too. So we we hear very few good things. We just hear the bad. Let me let me talk to that real quick on the um, the park incident. Um, as any incident, we look deeply into every complaint in our dispatch center. We are one of three CALEA accredited organizations and if you look out the, please give the acronym for CALEA what it stands for thank you um, we are one of three in the state um, there may be more now but um, we're it's very just it's we manage by policies and procedures back to the to the Kroger just because someone calls and says that they're at Kroger our dispatchers are still going to ask them for an address and that may be where some of these misconceptions of our dispatchers don't know where they are and I what's don't know the going on. I, you know, I and what they do when they don't get an answer is they continue the process of questioning. But they have a policy and procedure, and, and they go through the questions in order every time. If we start deviating from that, the issue that we run into is someone will forget a step. Someone will forget to ask a question. Um, so we, they have a very specific procedure that they need to go through with every call. And you're going to be faced with those same situations of people not knowing where they're at if you have your own visa. Um, with the situation of the Kroger, we have multiple Krogers. So when people say that, hey, hey I'm over here in Irmo, there's Irmo, the city of Columbia. They could say I'm right here um, at the Waffle House. I mean, there's multiple Waffle Houses. There's a Kroger here. There's also a Kroger over on San Andrews Road right by uh, Broad River Road. So we have to make sure if we send an ambulance, a fire truck, or a law enforcement officer to the wrong location, that is delaying the whole process completely. It's helped that it never arrives to and where it's needed. So how do, how everything you, is recorded, so we can, if you do get those complaints, I encourage you to send them over to us. Everything is recorded. The case with the Irmo call, no one knew where they were at. They called it multiple different things. We had an Irmo officer um, in around 44 seconds, I think he was on scene. He knew exactly where they were, and we were um, um, relaying that information to him. But you're still going to be faced with those kind of location obstacles just because, um, you know, when when we get those phone calls and they use, you know, I'm right over here in Irmo or I'm right over here in Casey. That's a large area to some people. They think that Harbison is Irmo. You know. We are very location driven, and even if they don't know the address, they can start off with the street. I'm on St. Andrews Road. I just, you know, people that are on Lake Murray, they're in the middle of the lake, and they've got to figure out their boat is sinking. 
and we have to encourage them to hey what's what kind of house do you see out there do you the see the towers do you i mean there's a whole process through it but you can't get help if you don't know where you're at i mean we have situations where people just scream into the phone but the technology it's the not gps there. is there i mean it's it's, it's not, not there for dispatch centers to be able to query a, a, they've gone to phase two like nikki explained yeah. But they haven't gone to the point, five, a football field, or five football fields, imagine that, that area, in a congested, built-up urban area. Right. And a 911 call comes in, and all we have is, yeah, officer, we just received a hang-up phone call from this GPS coordinate. We need for you to circle right. that area and just look. And it, what if they're looking from all the way around Columbia Mall? And they're looking for what? or they're looking for an uh, accident. There's multiple accidents. You've got to be able to articulate where you're at. Even keep in mind, that's why we encourage people, if you are going to panic, and most people do, in an emergency situation, please, by all means, keep your landline phone. You're not going to, if you're not going to be able to, um, um, you know, get a cordless phone, uh, whatever, but if you are going to um, have a problem letting somebody know where you're at, you've got to be able to, um, to get that. Through the landline, if they pick it up and call 911, leave it off the hook, we know exactly right where there. it is. You send them right there and say we've got a, a, a phone off the hook and they can go right to If they're not using voice over IP. Correct. That's, yeah. It, technology is our friend, but technology can also be our worst enemy. And we're trying to get the proper resources, emergency services, to save lives. That's our purpose. And we have state-of-the-art state of the art equipment. It's not like our equipment is antiquated. We have a brand new system. It is next generation ready. But I don't think your system is, is capable of doing the technology that we need to do to capture location. If you're saying that you can't handle GPS coordinations from a, cordless phone because somebody calls you because they don't have the certain generation phone to give you that then your equipment is not handling it i mean that's not that's not good Sir, that's that's a shortfall nationally that's that that's not a lexington yeah, county problem equipment. that's just that's vehicles. we have the absolute most up-to-date system that at&t offers for the call routing systems that we have the so annie alley we feeds bought, we everything the same thing. Mm -hmm. i'm sorry whatever we bought would do the same exactly thing. it would be the same there's nobody out there working on I'm not going to say nobody's out there working on it. I'm sure there are people working on it, but it hasn't hit the streets yet. And I'm guessing, too, that if we had our own and somebody was at somewhere on Broad River Road and our map does like this, um, even if we hired people that lived in town who lived here for 20, 30 years, um, at some point you're going to have to send the fire truck or the ambulance. and. They're going to need an address, whether the person on the phone may know where it is, but the person driving the ambulance is still going to have to have the address, I guess. And understand that with it, we always ask for the address. If you do not, and I don't, we promote to the public, know where you are, always, always, always. But we are going to ask questions, landmarks. There was a call down by the airport some time ago where um, someone picked up someone on the side of the road and she went into cardiac arrest. Okay, she had no idea where she was. She was on a road and all she could give our dispatchers was landmarks. That's it. And we listened to the call and basically the dispatcher was able to talk the ambulance in by talking to this citizen, giving uh, medical instructions on, you know, can, can you put your ear down to her nose and see if she's breathing. All the dispatchers are doing this through the entire process of trying to find, find her. We had an ambulance there in seven minutes. So you will have the great successes, and you will have times where um, a call has jumped from dispatch from Richland County to Lexington County, um, from Batesburg Leesville to some to, to county. You'll have those situations, and what we do is we just try to do the best job we possibly can for the citizens. And do y'all? I know y'all just built that place, but <clears throat> say. Do y'all buy equipment every year or every two years or just whenever it comes out or how does that? It depends on the, um, how, what the expected life expectancy of that equipment when new technology comes out. Um, when we purchase something, it comes, we do annual maintenance. Um, and if it's a UPS, uh, you know, like a power supply or a new CAD, as um, new technologies come out, 
we either integrate them with our equipment or um, if it's more cost effective to buy a whole new system, we go through the whole procurement and we give some purchasing. And I'll give you an example. In 2009, we did a full upgrade and overhaul of our dispatch center. Okay? In 2013, we completed construction of our new facility. We're always looking at providing the best possible service that we can to our citizens. And y'all put new equipment in that new building or move? Or? And the capability that we currently have too, and um, I'm not sure if any of you came to the building dedication that we had uh, when it opened, but we maintained six radio consoles and dispatch center locations, consoles, po uh, positions in our old 911 center. So we literally have a hot site backup. So if anything happens where we need to leave our building, and it wouldn't be to, to, due to power going out or anything like that, but let's say there's a, a chemical spill or something that makes us leave our facility. We have a 911 center ready, hot, ready to go. All we have to do is get dispatchers there and they can start answering calls. Additionally, if we have, let's say we have a, a major emergency, disaster, and we need to get more dispatchers on the radio, we run out of console positions, that, that position, that location can be run simultaneously with our new center, seamlessly. So we could go as high as 18 or 20 dispatchers if we needed to. Being you mentioned individual dispatchers, uh, you, you were covering the um, cost that's received through the cell phones and the hardwire, uh, that you could not use that for call takers. What is the cost of a call taker? Um, I provided Chief Buck with our county estimate, with what we pay for a dispatcher, and it's salary and benefits about forty-five thousand a year. Yeah, it was forty-five and some ch and some change. Okay. And now, one thing that we are doing in in Lexington, in uh, for the county dispatch center, is we're going to a call taker, call dispatcher organization. We just last year created a call taker position. This is a lower grade position that their sole purpose is to answer 911 calls. Okay? So they can be answering 911 calls while the dispatchers are communicating with field units and dispatching calls. It's, 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 um, it's a benchmark that's used across the country in different dispatch centers and it's something we're striving to get to in our new, new dispatch center. Uh, because now we're going to have the number of consoles to allow us to be able to do it. We didn't have that in our former dispatch center. But that would be two people for every, I'm saying, call. So you, and that may be what that person was telling me. Maybe they were talking about that, switching to two people. Uh, no, because he was saying two people should. Do, could you, you have still to let people you. take breaks and go to the restroom? Yeah. So it would take two need. for a shift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we take about 1,300 calls a day. So Y'all do in the county? And that's um, typically... Um, Dispatchers could be call taking and dispatching, but we are trying to move towards a separate call taker and dispatcher um, type facility. Um, and but we need more call takers to be able to go to that because two, if you have two call takers per shift, they can answer 1,300 mm -hmm. calls. Yeah. Do we know or do y'all know how much calls we get here? Are y'all dispatch for us? Is there a the only thing we were able to do, um, because you are not broken out down as a PSAP, our system does not allow us to, to break down this jurisdiction. The only thing I was able to provide to the chief was the number of landlines in your jurisdiction. The number of landlines? The number of landlines that are being tracked through our GIS department and through the phone companies. But there's no way to know how many calls you get from this area? No, um, there really isn't. And we've looked at numerous different ways to try to figure it out. Um, but because you don't have that barrier around you, um, because right now the municipalities that have PSAPs provide us with that information. We, don't, we know how many our PSAP has taken, but the other PSAPs have to provide those numbers to us for the reimbursement piece. Okay. And in the town of Vermo, we're in both Richland and Lexington County. What problem does that create for us? Some we've already talked about. Um, that call in the park uh, went to Irmo di or went to uh, Richland County Dispatch. Some came here. It all depended on what wireless phone they were on, what service they had. Well, that dispatcher that you um, would have, um, if y'all choose to go that route, would um, be receiving calls just like we do from towers in Richland County, towers in Lexington County, and they would have to figure out that jurisdictional boundary and then be able to 
transfer that call to Richland County um, or Lexington County for EMS um, service. Um, the Irmo police probably would be um, a little bit more cut and dry for them, um, except for the City of Columbia police that responds in some of those little pockets. Um, but you would still have those jurisdictional issues that that one person would have to do and do pretty quick while they're on that phone. One thing we've done with Chief Buck is um, some of the properties back, your properties back right up to Richland County. I mean, and, and you know, almost like the backyard is in Richland County. Um, so what we've done is working with uh, Chief Buck is we actually put notes in our computer aided dispatch that if a call comes in for this property, okay, you are to dispatch a remote PD even though your system tells you not to. You're to, you're to dispatch a remote PD. And we try to work with them um, on some of these properties that we have these issues with. And, and, and I don't know, and I'm just asked this for my train of thought, but I'm thinking West Columbia is bigger than us population-wise, and Casey is probably too. Um, but if I take those number of calls that they have, would I be safe in trying to figure out we might have somewhere close to somewhere in between there? We looked at multiple ways to do it. We even looked at possibly, we do, um, our CAD system has um, uh, event codes. What are they called? I'm sorry. Nature. nature codes for each thing. We have 145 now. Mm -hmm. um, we have 145 nature codes. But that would be very imprecise. Um, it'd be very hard to determine which nature codes are this, which nature codes are this, which ones were wireless, which ones weren't. Um, and the other issue is it's the interstates in the areas. You do have 20, 26 out here that you could get wireless calls for 26. Um, interstates play a big part in the number of calls that you get wirelessly. To answer your question, um, I wouldn't even want to want to guess whether or not they'd be comparable or not. It would be, it would truly be a swag. It would be a guess. Okay. Well, y'all been very helpful. Very helpful. Y'all have any more questions? Sure. Chief, just figure it out. <laughs> Get back to it. We hear that occasionally. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much thank for having us. We appreciate coming. it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think you said you had a... Yes, um, under the receipt of communications. Had a couple phone calls in regards to Mosley Street. Um, you know, Mosley actually intersects um, Eastview right at the entrance of the park and comes down and would normally come out actually on Woodrow Street by what I think is Service Master now or mm -hmm. um, Caldwell Banker. Uh, Caldwell Banker, Banker or, yeah. or the relative. Church Street. Church Street. Yes, no, the I, other one, Mosley. No, Mosley. That runs Mosley intersects with it stops church. church. Yeah, it goes from church all the way up to Woodrow. You said Eastview. Oh, okay. okay, I'm sorry. It's close enough. The the Mosley Street actually has a very large ravine. <laughs> um, Bob, some time back, had contact made contact with the South Carolina Department of Transportation about us bringing that road into compliance or some type of compliance and making it usable again. It would assist us greatly with some of those residents along there mm -hmm. and actually keep Church Street from having what might as well be considered a dead end into the park. Mm -hmm. um, had some conversations with our attorney and he's had some conversations and with some of the folks in Lexington County that there may be some possibilities of some help with doing something with that road. If nothing more um, on a short term is to make it passable by something, um, foot traffic or that type thing. Um, but I think I would like to ask if, if council would agree to ask the town administrator to get with the town attorney and uh, get the major players so that everybody's talking to the same person and uh, kind of come back to us with what some possibilities would be. As I understand it, DOT says we can do whatever we want to, they'll agree, but it's up to us. 
Well, I mean, we have to do it to their standard. Yeah, to their standard. But they're not paying, I guess. Correct. We can do it right. Right. Okay. Correct. Correct. So um, that was my receipt of communications and starting to revitalize that um, process and get the town administrator and town attorney talking to the movers and shakers that might be able to help us with that. I think it's a good idea. It bothers me that we have a road in town. Mm -hmm. It bothers me, one, that we have one that's not paved, but more yeah. that we have one that's got a ravine in it that you can't cross to get from one end to the other. Right. It's, it's at the bottom talking about us, I don't say pouring concrete in it, but making a Ford so you could drive the Chevy to the levee and, <laughs> and cross. And then maybe the buses or people could, we could drop them off at Jake's building, they could walk down in there or something and get to the yeah. truck better. But yeah, I think we ought to look at that. Well, we yeah, we may, and I don't know either why we're talking about that, but even the road that's beside, um, I think that's Mosley, beside Taco Bell, we may one day want to look at opening that one too. Oh, that's Moa Street. Moa, okay, Moa, yes. yeah, that goes around there just for traffic purposes, but no big deal right now, but I think that one would be more important. Well, that was brought up before, and the only reason we haven't pursued that was because of the caching, the caching machine there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was when Lake Murray Boulevard was widened, there was some errors made in some uh, right-of-way that caused that road to be closed and it was closed on the plans as i understand it from dot to the point that the drainage that was put in now makes it very difficult to reopen that without totally redoing all of the underground drainage because hmm. we did go back several years after the winding and say, you know, sure, we should be able to open this for, you know, a few thousand dollars, and it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars because of drainage. So, and I had something that okay. I got a while ago, um, and I was going to bring it up at last meeting, and Bob wasn't here, so I wasn't sure. Um, this is something I had received. Um, and it's from the Learning Disabilities Association. They're just asking if you would make October um, Learning Disabilities Month. Um, so I just want y'all to have a copy of that. Y'all can let me know. I think they want us to respond probably yesterday um, or sooner. <laughs> Do a but, uh, but just let me know and then Bob can draw something up if we want to. If we don't want to, let Bob know too. Um, sorry for the delay, but I, I was going to do it last month. Bob wasn't here, so I thought, well, I'll just wait till later. Um, so it'd be a problem. Let me just kind of see. Yeah, we ought to do that. Any other um, received communications? Seeing none, next item on the agenda is Presentation by citizens. Uh, this is time where anyone who wants to address anything on the agenda tonight uh, may do so. All we ask is you come to the podium, give us your name and address for the record, and then what agenda item you want to speak about. Anyone? See none. Um, next item is unfinished business, item A. Third and final reading of Ordinance 1409 to rezone Lexington County tax map 1925-04-003, which is 7456 Eastview. That's where I got that address for. Somebody asked me the park address the other day, and I told them 7456 Eastview. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was wrong. Um, anyway, we're changing it from single-family residential to office commercial. Is there a motion for third and final reading? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? Again, just for identification, I mean, we have two rezonings on here. Um, it is that little property right behind Zaxby's parking lot. It is. Mm -hmm. And I think from what Bob said, it crosses the road and actually comes over and touches. Yes, yeah, weird lines. Well, it's like right in the middle. It comes to the middle of these two. That's where the property lines all oh, touch. Okay. And then that line of bread goes to the middle of the road. Correct. Um, 
And the only question or only comment or only thing I wanted to ask, and Jake may not have time to get to it today, but my concern is, and I just I want to make sure that we do this, and the people build the building, put the parking lot in, do whatever they do, um, and six months down the road, six years, whatever. Um, they have a couple accidents where people are leaving their restaurant in their parking lot or whatever, and people driving on Eastview, whatever. Um, and then they decide, we're tired of this, we're just going to close down one side of our parking lot so people on Eastview can't cut through our parking lot anymore. Um, I know if they do that, I'm guessing they would have the legal court challenge of closing the road that's been open for years and yada yada yada. Um, but is there anything we can do to make sure that we're not construed as being helpful to that or make a statement that they can't do that and they understand they can't do that if they do their own their own and we're not? Well, I mean, I just don't want us to one day say, well, y'all should have told us we can't do that. Um, the, you've got a situation where there's no way in the world you're going to be able to come back and say, well, hey, uh, we're going to zone this, but only on condition that in the future you don't come back and try to close a road. You know, we have various parcels of right-of-way, which are platted, shown on plats, uh, dedicated, named, used. Um, there has been a historic usage and acceptance by the town where that road Eastview uh, would more than likely be deemed to be a public roadway. Uh, there has generally been acceptance of the usage by the town. We've always been kind of guarded in what we do and do not accept as a, as a town roadway, but I think the town pretty much accepts Eastview as a town road, don't we, Bob? Yeah. It's been there for I thought it was a private driveway. I think. We, we do we maintenance on the it road and so forth. Private yeah. driveway or is it a public road? It is still on private property because there's not an easement filed. But as I talked with Mr. Moore, the fact that it's been used as a road forever, I don't know how many years. There's a, there's a concept known as public dedication where when a private landowner um, allows the public to in fact use the road and the, the public authority in effect has taken and done maintenance and so forth on it that the, the roadbed is basically being dedicated to the public. Many times people get get confused about this concept of a right of way and what a right of way is. A lot of public right of way is actually on property owned by somebody else. Uh, there's, you, you can own a piece of property and someone have an easement or right of way over that property. So the actual fee simple title doesn't make that much difference. The question is, does the town in fact acknowledge and have a right of way in the road? I think most any judge with any sense at all would basically declare that it is a town road. And in order to close it, you're going to wind up having to bring an action to do that. Um, yeah, but you, we've been for years have said that it's a private driveway and that it wasn't a public road. So now all of a sudden, because we need to use it, or somebody wants to use it, it becomes a public road now? Well, I'm not sure that for years we've said it's a public, a private driveway. Sure I've we have. Said, I've said Eastview? Yes, we have. We've said that that is not a public road, it's a private driveway. It doesn't <coughs> have a curb cut for a regular road. It has well, a driveway get the easement. They wouldn't give us the easement. No, because it's a private driveway. Yeah. We have, we have we have houses which are basically built along the road. Our police use it. I know it's a road. You know it's a road. I've been trying to get it paid for the last 12 years. When I try to make it a point that we need to pave it, we are, I'm getting pushed back that it's a private road. It's not a public road. And now I'm hearing you say out your mouth right now that all of a sudden it's a public road and that we can have the right to make sure they don't close it off or whatever. I mean, come on, it's a 90 degree, 180 degree turnaround. First, what's first time, first time I've ever heard anyone come out and officially say that Eastview Road is a public driveway is, is tonight. Now, 
Maybe, maybe that's changed. Uh, I've always taken the position that Eastview is a public right of way. I, as far back as 1981, when we were trying to get yeah, okay. the block grant, grant for the for the road, yeah. we basically were trying to get um, we were trying to get rights of way adjoining the road. I don't have a dog in this fight, but I'm yeah. saying y'all, it sounds like y'all are doing a 180 degree turn. All of a sudden now it's a public road, so we have to make sure they be protected so they don't close it off. And, and the it's truth a private driveway, you can do anything you want in your private and driveway. And the truth of the matter was, is, if it's a public road, then we need to maintain it by allocating funds to pave it and maintain it. But if well, it's not, then right. it's not. What y'all want to do in okay. regard to allocating funds to pave and that sort of stuff, it, I don't have a dog in that fight. I, was I don't either. I mean, I don't live on that road, but I'm saying yeah. the, the, the residents that did live on or do live on that road have always maintained they wanted to pay and they want to get it fixed. But, you know, we've always told them that, no, we can't do that because it's a private road. Well, it's a private road. There are lots of public roads in this town that are not paved. Now, would I love to see Eastview paved? Yes, I would. Um, would I love that very much? Yes, I would. But that's 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 not my call. I understand. Um, you know, we've got a street sign up that says Eastview Road. Um, exactly. If, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if in fact someone ever did try to close the road, it would be a relatively simple thing to basically condemn the road back and open it back up as a public roadway. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not certain, of course, you know, the answer is, the question I have is, at some point in time in the future, could somebody bring an action to close the road? The answer is sure. Uh, at some point in time in the future, um, you know, is, is there any way that I could do something or put some, some document on the paper that would say, you can't do that? Uh, not that I know of. I don't know how you would go about doing that. You know. Um, whether or not we acknowledge that road as a public road or not uh, it is a is a question I guess that's still open for debate apparently some of us do some of us don't um, but it's been named it's been used I think that in the future if they ever tried to do something there to close it off they would have a difficult time but what it zoned isn't going to matter one hill of beans in that fight um, somebody else apparently now has title to the naked roadbed there and um, um, whether it's zoned R1 or general commercial or neighborhood commercial the argument that it's a public no it's a private no it's sort of a public road is it, the same argument so to me what it is zoned is not relevant to the argument about is it a public or private road um well i was mainly concerned about the the use since it's changing use from a homeowner who probably would like to have the road open to you know, commercial development who may one day decide i'm putting a fence up back there and heck with all this mm -hmm. and put it up without permission and say hey it's my property i'll put it up do something about it and now we're off and, and that, mm -hmm. i just want to make sure that we're not if you want to protect the access road um, from encroachment, I guess you could require that there be some sort of a uh, public acknowledgement or public granting of an easement. The problem you're going to have there though still is, as I understand it, the two property lines meet in the middle, don't they? So, I mean, yeah, even if two properties, so one property between all, all, this one, all the properties yeah. meet in the middle. But I mean, middle. from there to the road, Lake Murray, there's one other property or two because you got Zaxby's, the barbershop, barber shop and and here, Correct. same and time. Dems. Any one of them at some point could say, I don't want this, so I'm building a fence on my property line. I, Boom, I don't know. Um, and if, if that happened, I think we could, well, I know we could address it in any number of, of ways. Um, but it sounds like a problem which certainly at this point we don't have any indication that it exists but regardless what it's on you're going to potentially have that same issue out there um, 
you know, if if you want to tell them that we're, we're not going to zone the property unless we're positive that there's something on record where you've given us an easement to the your half of the roadbed, I guess you could tell them that. Um, they probably would give you the easement if that's what you wanted. Um, I don't know that we would, because it ain't be wide enough. Because it can't be no wider than Lake Murray Kirk cut, so yeah. I don't think that's wide enough. And I think my whole was if people pull in there and eat and park, they're probably not going to go back to Atlanta Bread and come out. They're going to cut down that road, mm -hmm. which would be more use on that road than probably what's been on there forever. And if, people coming in and out of the other places. If we ever do find a way to pay these view, you're going to probably need, I believe it's a 50 foot right of way in order yep. to, which which we do not that's have now. 30 maybe or something? Or no, it's 50 foot for, what a, is? for a public road. I mean, what's in there? A 20 maybe. Oh, there, there isn't, which is why we had the problem last time we wanted yeah, to but I mean, because we need to get permission from each property. What's the current cut? 20? Or is it a 50 foot curb cut? Uh, no, it's not. It's probably a 20, 25 at the yeah. most. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, um, you know, at some point in time, if you ever did pay these, which I would love to see, uh, I'd love to see water and sewer down there too. Um, uh, you'd have to do your engineering and secure your rights of way. One of the problems we had again in the 1980s when we did the community block grant, where we had a water and sewer, they insisted on being paid. For, they insisted on being paid for us to run the water and sewer lines to the houses. And uh, we told them we didn't need money, and they didn't believe us. So the block grant went away. We worked really hard to get it. Um, but you know, that's that's the not for tonight's discussion. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, and I think too, if Kim can incorporate all this into the minutes well enough that we'll have a record that we did discuss it and kind of say, yeah, they're on their own if they do something different. But yeah. we're not helping that or assisting that. Very fine. Thank you. Um, where are we at? Oh, any more questions? Any more discussion? All in favor then of third and final reading uh, to change the zoning from single family to um, office commercial, do so with show of hand. Next item is. Uh, item B, approval of lease agreement, amount of $12,000 for the property on Eastview Drive between the town of Vermo and Mr. Davis. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. And is there a second? Second. And any discussion? Um, I'd ask that it be placed there. We have the lease agreement. Uh, there was some errors in the agreement last meeting and we deferred it to uh, have our attorneys to take a look at it and make some corrections. Uh, the lease agreement has been sent to everyone electronically. Uh, this is the property, oh, I'll get my roads right, but Eastview, at the end of Eastview, right at the entrance to the park. Um, it is uh, property that we have used in the past. Uh, been allowed to use for some overflow parking for the park um, and we looked at this property in lieu of the cut through that we were looking at into the back of um, Union Church uh, we were looking at you know quite a lengthy or quite a costly amount with the church maintaining the lock on the gate to determine whether we could use it or not. And uh, as I have always felt, if you wanted to own something, to control something, you needed to own it. And rather than putting, at that time, the estimate was eighty to $90,000 at the minimum to open up that passageway for foot traffic between the park and the Union church parking lot um, this property would give us uh, quite a bit of area to continue growth in the park and uh, 
used for additional events that would be taking place in the park. I want to be perfectly clear, it's not just for the Oakwood Strut. Granted, the Oakwood Strut is one of the events, but we've got one coming up this Saturday that there's already concerns of parking. The Oakwood Strut does make a lot of use of outside parking and busing people in, um, but I don't know that that's been done with what's happening this weekend. And um, the thought of leasing this property as opposed to trying to purchase it is that we would apply for a grant that would be a matching grant uh, that would be in an amount. We know that the grant's out there and we could use that to purchase it at a later time if indeed it proved to be beneficial to the town. Any more discussion? Yes. Um, I've looked into the grant. I'm not sure this property qualifies. I, mean, I don't, I'm not an expert on grants, so I, I'm just saying from what I've read, it may not. I, the, grant the grant says there can't be, all right, we already have a park. To make this part of it, is what doesn't work. It's no, got to be the big. You have to have. Uh, you can't add on and use the grant. You got to use it from the start. Yeah, we're not adding on to park. We're creating a new. I'm just telling you. We're separated by a road. Separated by a road. That's a new. Okay. We're I, buying a new park. The fact remains, the grants are not up until January 2016, 16. which means we pay 24,000 in rent. And then buy the property for one hundred and ninety thousand. Yeah, that's about what we paid for the park. <laughs> so I'm concerned about it. I mean, we've already spent a lot of money. I don't know whether we need to spend this much more. And with all due respect to Mr. Davis, because it's a nice piece of property, um, I'm not sure it would appraise. I'm not sure at all it would appraise. I I do think it's a nice piece of property, but I don't know that the town would appreciate us buying it. To tell you the truth. I thought the, I read, did you take that out, the appraised value? Did you take that out? No, it's coming in the lease. I think it says appraised or fair market value. I can't remember which one. Yeah, whatever the um, appraised at the time of purchase. You try to purchase it at appraised market value? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Mr. Davis. Fair market value. Fair market fair value, right. Mm -hmm. you'll, go, you'll go along with whatever that appraisal is? I mean, you don't have to. I mean, if you don't, then. And one thing too, and I don't know for sure, Bob might remember, but as far as the church, United Methodist Union, and I, what, what, they know mm -hmm. the union. Um, how many parking places was available back here behind that building? But you had it was a couple hundred. I mean, you, yeah, yeah. You had I a couple hundred plus. You had the possibility of, I don't say people parking at across the street at the Carolina Wings and using that entryway too to get in, which would make that parking a little bit kind of available too. Um, I agree with Kathy, it's, it's um, I mean, if we were just, say, using it on a temporary part-time basis, um, I just don't know if we need it for the whole year and how many parking we'll get out of it, which we would have to do something to get it prepared for that. Um, and then, and then in my eyes, in the long haul, it will help some at the Oak Street. It won't help a lot because we still got more people coming in than that. It might help some at like Saturday's event. Um, I don't have any people can show up for that, but um, I don't think nobody really knows right now. But um, <laughs> we just have to wait and see. And it may help in something like that too. I don't know. Um, I just wish it was for a lesser amount. Um, and for a shorter period. I, I understand it's the amount he has in the property, which I, I understand. That's, I'm just not sure we should spend public money on this. Any more comment? Mr. Younger, is he not around? Mr. Younger, is he not around? I think his email said he was out on business trip. I don't know where he went, but it's a business trip for this week. He's got a major presentation in the sport room. 
Um, I like to hear it from Mr. Younger. I want to know what he thinks about it. I mean, you want to put it on hold until next week? I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, whatever you want to do, I'll do. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can either vote for it up or down, or we can, um, someone can make a, um, an amendment to defer it. It still needs to get three votes to defer it. Um, and then we go back to vote. It's a big enough decision that we all ought to be here. Yeah, that's so agree. I, I mean, that's what I said. So okay. $200,000, $200,000. Yeah. yeah. Tell me. You want to defer it? We, we can defer until Mr. Younger gets here. I'll uh, I say I made the motion, so I'll amend it to defer until the next regular meeting. Mm -hmm. September 17th, 19th. It doesn't sound like it will pass at this point, so uh, at least let's let uh, him have his say. Well, I mean, you can take a chance and say, and you can always put it back on either later, or you can just defer it, yeah. Because um, there's nothing that would keep it from coming back on, even if it failed tonight. Because um, any councilman can put it back on. Or we can defer it, either one. So there's a motion to defer. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? On deferring? Being none, all in favor of deferring it uh, until September the 17th, uh, do so with your hand. All good? Um, so, the motion has been amended to defer um, in until the 17th of September. Yeah, and that was the amendment. So the amendment passes. Now we got to vote on the approval of the lease, which has been deferred, and just vote again, I guess. Um, all in favor of? Wait, a minute, we just deferred that. We well, we voted on the amendment. We approved the amendment, which was deferred. Now we got to approve or vote for the. The uh, am I right? Uh, no, so first, so you won't, you don't need to vote on the, the approval of the But that was an amendment, wouldn't it? That was just voted on the amendment. Defer. The amendment was to defer. Defer the decision okay. of voting. Okay, all right. So, next item then item C, which is the approval of budget amendment in the amount of uh, 1050 bucks for off duty police officers for the summer relief festival to be held August 23rd. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Is there a second? I will second. Um, any discussion? Just one thing. I thought from the beginning that this was a charitable thing for the church and sharing God's love. Am I wrong? It's for sharing God's love. I think they're going to do cans, cans of food. Okay. Okay. Yeah. People, in order to get but in... If they make money, where's the money going? To the church? Well, it will go to the vendors. Oh, okay. It'll just be um, canned food. Now, the vendors who are there... And, yeah, cause the, okay. they, they get to keep their money. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. The farmers market people. Yeah, they would somebody pay paid for the bands and stuff, right? If I remember correctly, mm -hmm. all the bands were free except for the root doctors. The root doctors, which well, said something about a lesser charge, but they were still paying them. Okay. And I think he said between what they were spending on advertising and whatever else you spend on, they were spending about ten thousand dollars already. The church was to pay for the band and pay wow. for advertising, okay. whatever. Ten thousand dollars. I think it's what he said is what they ten thousand dollars is spent, minutes? or will be spending when it's all said and done. They'll have watch box out there tomorrow morning, set up for four or five hours during their morning show at the park, promoting that. They're going to go there and stand behind the camera and make faces. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they aren't they going to start at five o'clock or something? That, we're opening the gate early. Uh, yeah, if you want to go at five, Hardy, <laughs> just show up real good at dark. Yeah, I thought about that. <laughs> they're going to do that. But what they're asking us, and this I think he said was five officers. That was all he had. To six do. hours. Five. It was two. Well, I don't know they originally, but I think 
but you said because of the crowd or the expected Very crowd sure. or that they Two would need ships. five. Or they would need, and we only have five. They yeah. originally thought they were going to have a thousand or two thousand people, and I thought that would be two officers. Which, right. uh, the gentleman was here two weeks ago to discuss it with y'all. Uh, the numbers grew. They've done a direct mailing of 15,000 people uh, to invite them to come to the park. They've done a lot of signage, uh, not just in the town limits, but the Crater St. Andrews area, encouraging people to come. Uh, so they're anticipating four to five thousand people right. showing up. And I think from which is a large amount of people. Yeah. So I think from what I understand from him was, y'all were telling him you're gonna to have to have more police pits. More. Yeah. We 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 committed to two. So all of a sudden I grew to five. That was when they discussed it with y'all two weeks ago. Uh, they were talking about how many invitations they sent out. They did a direct mailing. Then uh, they've also done a lot of advertising uh, signs in people's yards and that kind of thing on street corners. And they're projecting uh, having about four or five thousand people. Uh, it's always easier to send police officers home than it is to call them to come in. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if we have five officers out there and they have five hundred people show up, we will send all of them home, but one or two. It's thirty-five dollars an hour. Is that right? Thirty. Thirty dollars an hour. Thirty dollars an hour. Thirty dollars. Eight hours per officer. Well, it was two to eight, so it'd be six hours unless they got to get there early. Seven hours. Oh, okay. Seven hours. They're early and stay and make sure everybody's left before they go home. Uh, 30 minutes ahead and 30 minutes after. I don't know that we can legally use town money again for paying for this. I know we have turned down even the, uh, um, the market mm -hmm. wanting us to kick in some money so that they could have some entertainment in the little park over here mm -hmm. during the um, farmer's market. And we can't do that. Um, you're looking at $1,050 here. Let's assume that it, all that's fine. You've only talked about the police department. What about all the time that WITS people are going to be well, there? And the cleanup afterwards and putting out the Herby Kirby's and picking them up. Um, the things that we have to, and these are issues that I raised at the last meeting with um, the church yeah. that we have to deal with with the Okra Strut. And the Okra Strut is a town event. It is owned by the town. All the proceeds come into the town and are voted on by, really by this council and the commission as to where they go. So, um, I think there's a lot more cost involved in the thousand fifty dollars. You know, um, well, I think there are we just the other because I think um, I know they had some bathroom rentals and whatever you call it. Yeah, because they had not even calculated that in when they were here last time. I think they had, I and mean, I think that's part of that ten thousand because I think something uh, each of the two had cost for. Um, and not just bathroom rooms, but it was for trash cans too. Extra think. trash cans and porta potties and, and their marketing cost. And mm -hmm. So I think they got all that in. So it's not going to be in, involved in having to do anything? I'm sure he will, but it's. Uh, yeah. It's not a. Um, yeah. And we just had the uh, Lake Murray. Fourth of July thing over there, um, and I don't know we charged them anything, did we? No, we didn't get charged anything for that. That was all by the Lake Murray Country. They handled Maybe. all that. Did we have? Didn't have extra police officers. I mean, wits over there to make sure they don't tear up his park. Right. <laughs> but we didn't have any extra expenses with that as no. opposed to. No. Okay. We didn't have no. And what? But then the you, you raised. Thing? Did we do put it in here? for the surface? Did we send any more? Spend any money on the circuit? They pay that's a business license fee. Right. And see, we charge them to use the park. Right. We will charge you to have a birthday party for your mother or father or an anniversary to use the picnic shelter. But now we're not charging anything here. I, I mean, we're stepping on a slippery slope. We didn't have a charge at that time, though. We just right. came up with that. 
We, have, I one, we have one now. I mean, yes. I, have, I, have a I know that, rental fee that the Bob store. has looked at that um, to um, to look at making this fair. Right. And we probably need to come up with some more rules just to make or, or call them rules, but whatever you call them to future guidelines that if you're gonna have this many people, you gotta have this, you got this many people, you gotta have that, you gotta yada yada. Yeah, I think you know, another big issue and I had just come from the last meeting, I had just come from a festival in Maggie's Valley where wind got up and one of these bouncy houses was picked up and toppled over the top of some um, pop up tents. And the kids who were in there thought it was a great ride. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's one of those things where, going back to the okra strut, we insist that all of those vendors provide us an insurance policy that holds the town as the lost payee on that. Do we have insurance policy for them? I have, I have one. Yeah, okay. Okay. They, mm -hmm. they sent me a hold harmless agreement, yes. Yeah. And we... I don't know, have we ever done this before? Well, it's new. We never had a. Oh, that's right. Whatever you call it. That's true. Empathy. We never yeah. asked us to pay a thousand bucks for security. Yeah. But we have been asked to pay ten thousand dollars a year to chamber, and I don't know how much to chamber to ten thousand to keep them in business. Chief, and they're both five is there a formula to used for the number of people like and everything? Thousand people, one cop, or thousand people, two cops, or. Officers. No, sir. It, it depends on the venue, the time of day, mm -hmm. whether alcohol is being served, the targeted audience. Um, there's lots of things that go into our estimation of how many officers it will take to provide security. But this was based on the, the probable number of people, right? It's based on the number of people they expect to be there, the type of event it's going to be, the time of day it's going to be held, their target audience. Okay. Well, and, tra we need and traffic to issues. Well, what if we just charge them a thousand fifty dollars for the use of the amphitheater? Oh well, we changed that after I talked to you last week. I mean, we it's didn't. We, it's in uh, fifteen hundred now. Fifteen, okay. You know, fifteen hundred. Okay. You know, Friday when we made it up. So okay. for people in the future, they'll be paying plus a security. And that's stop. based on. I think there's one in. Is it Riverbanks that has one in West Columbia? That has an outdoor amphitheater. Oh, everybody else charges from what I understand. I mean, is that fifteen hundred based on that? Yeah, two thousand. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's fifteen hundred to our discretion. Uh, Up to our discretion, or fifteen hundred dollars, whatever. You're the council. <laughs> we well, it'll be fifteen hundred right now unless we tell them no. And we yeah, I think it, uh, whatever. I think that's crazy. And I don't think you can charge that now. No. Oh, that no, 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 no. 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 Front, but I saw yeah. that. You know, we said when we built the park that we weren't going to establish rules until we saw a need for the rule. <laughs> and They're cropping up. <laughs> they, they are cropping up. But we didn't want to jump the gun and come up with, you know, a list of 25 rules that were not pertinent to the use of the park. This is the first time the amphitheater is going to be used. They're going to have bands in there. Um, they're going to have... Uh, use of that 400 amp service on the stage that's tied to the meter now granted they anchored the meter down real tight so it won't <laughs> spin off the wall but it's going to turn fast yeah. as they draw that electricity down and then yet that's again a cost for that's us our expense yeah that's our expense um, as well as the power that will be used out in the field for the Vendors, blow ups. Mm -hmm. the blow-ups, uh, all of that, again, is a cost for us. And I'm saying we haven't looked at that. We only looked at the police. Now, I'm not taking away. The police is absolutely necessary. Um, but It's going to cost us more than that. <laughs> which is absolutely necessary, too, to yeah. make sure that the park remains in good condition and ready for the next event as it looks like it's going to start here very quickly. And I think too, and I'm not 100% sure because the guys talked to me a couple of times, but I don't know. Um, but from my understanding, um, you know, they're thinking 2,000 people is what they were thinking. 
and that's what they were planning on. That's what they hopefully assume. Um, I think after they spoke to Chief Buck and they got a better idea that if you do all this stuff here and watch what 57 does, whatever, then you're going to have more than that. Um, once it got more than that, then it became, okay, now it's going to be five officers instead of two. Um, and, um, so part of this, too, is, is, is us telling them about, you know, this is going to be bigger than you think, so we need you to have more police officers than you think. Um, and basically what they're asking us is, can we pay for those? Um, and that's our, our choice. Do we do that or not do that? Um, I don't think it's that much money. No, and I, I do know we I give to we sort of told um, them we would. To give to um, the man. Um, <laughs> chamber. And we also give to Keep the Midlands Beautiful, which are kind of the five oh one C three type charitable type places. Um, I do think it's good that we got a price now so that anybody else comes to in us the in the future. And I'm guessing that fifteen hundred will pay for that amp. You pay and, for the and maybe wit showing up to make sure everybody did everything. Um, but this is one that kind of caught us. Yeah, it did. I'm gonna say off guard before we got our ducks in the road type thing. Um, any more questions or discussion? All in favor of giving the thousand fifty bucks to um, the uh, church, which is basically going to the summer relief festival, um, do so with show of hand. All opposed. It will fail for lack of a, or lack of a what we call it, majority. Um, new business, first reading of ordinance 1410 to annex Lexington County tax map uh, 2797-01019, which is 107 Harbin Court. Is there a motion for um, for first reading? So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? That's the little map I handed out to mm -hmm. the, the uh, square, the uh, lot number is number 19. It's the mattress place, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, and I think you mentioned something about they were going to do some development. Well, I don't have a developer here, but I, the engineer is here if you want to ask him a specific okay. question. Good evening. Hey there. Larry Watts with Hybrid Engineering. Yeah. How are y'all doing? Good. Uh, John Hill Group is proposing to build a, a, a retail, uh, they call it a vanilla box. It's just an empty box at this point. He's just uh, wanting to put some, some rental space there. Um, that's what he's proposing, and you've already seen the sketch of the property and uh, what he's wanting to do there. It's a, it's a big area. I mean, it covered all the way up to like the number three that you see there in the green. So he's buying more of this land behind here. He's already bought it. He, oh, he okay. owns all of that, yes. He owns okay. it all. And this, one of these, he owns that one with the one on it. All of that. The green. Yes, the green's already in town, and that's the reason we're doing this annexation now, so he can develop the whole mm -hmm. piece okay. of land, the orange part and the part that's in town. How is that 19 not in the town limits and we surrounded it? And well, 17 is Ethan Allen. They didn't want to, they never annexed in either. But I mean, 19 is surrounded by green on your map. They didn't sign a petition and they did the individual petition instead of a. We, we didn't do a 75 yeah. 25 petition. These were all 100% because all these other ones are the school buses and. Uh, yeah, the parking lot, band parking lot, mm -hmm. and they all want to come in. How, so, do, how do we annex everything around 19 and not 19? He didn't how do we surround them like that? We I couldn't take them. We couldn't take them. Because they don't sign. If they don't sign, it's not okay. We surrounded them. We can't <laughs> <laughs> this. They've this all said they got to sign. Alley? All we got to do is send it 525 petitions. Uh, have you talked to like those kind of people by any chance? Well, we have, there's buffers in place that protect them. Okay. Is it a... Do they know? Well, okay. At one time, I was president of the homeowners association. Okay. We negotiated with um, the real estate Sally Chuck Sally. Okay. And he gave them a significant bumper. I didn't know whether you knew that or. I, I don't know the history of that particularly. Mm -hmm. um, we, when we got the. The initial survey done, we had a 70-foot buffer okay, in place, good. and that's what 
Uh -huh. That design that you're looking at has that incorporated, but now I came and talked with Kathleen Lovelace and mm -hmm. we went, we looked at the, the zoning ordinance and by the zoning ordinance of the town, we're only required to have a 20 foot buffer. Mm -hmm. So as it stands right now, we're adhering to the 70 foot width with the present design. But now, I, you know, the owner might, might want to say, well, I want to use that extra 50 feet. There, there were some things in writing. I don't have them. Uh, the homeowners do that homeowners backed up to the, No, the homeowners themselves that back up to that land kept the things in writing. Okay. Um, I called the homeowners association. They had nothing. Because he's a new president, so he didn't know. But the homeowners do, if, and I'll be glad to tell you. And it's just the pred, the homeowners that back up to, uh -huh. to his property? There's only three or four. Okay. But I'll be glad to tell okay. you. Well, if, it, if it's still the 70 foot, it's, I think it's it probably is probably what that is. Yeah. Um, I believe my client would be happy to hold to that since we're, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, presently. I, I think that's very reasonable. Okay. So this whole track right here is what's been, you said up to about the three. Right, because the building that you see there, that is that's the, the public uh, storage. The storage place. That's correct. So whatever is around them belongs to them. Correct. So Everything is wood back there, which is what they'll be clearing the. The development that he's talking about is just not on the orange thing, it's on this whatever belongs to it. It's a mall, like a okay. strip area, strip mall type thing with a bunch of stores. I, don't, I can't remember how many stores, but they're like 10, 12 uh, in the, boxes. In the design? Yeah. Um, it's a, a corner is the, the main anchor spot as he envisions it, but now it is just, that's conceptual. Right. Um, it, when they build it, it'll be the vanilla box, it'll just be an empty space. And whoever wants to come in can lease the whole thing, rent the whole thing, or half of it, or it can it's be something. divided up as it as it's uh, seen as it's seen to be rented out. And the important thing here is that it will also will require landscaping all the way up in front where you don't have it now. You've got the silk fences. Yeah. That yes. People have been complaining about that. It'll all be landscaped. Yeah, they, yeah. You're talking about in front. You're talking about along Harbin along Harbin along and that railroad little, track. That little side. Oh yeah, Harbin and that little side road that goes back towards Quill Valley. Right right there. There. Yep, right there. Yeah. But what about along the railroad track? No, Same. because okay. that's not part of what's been developed. Okay. Okay. Got it. Any more questions? Any more discussion? All in favor then of the first reading to annex this property, 107 Parkland Court, into the town, uh, do so with your of hand. All opposed? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, next is item B, approval of an intergovernmental cooperative agreement between the County of Lexington, the Town of Vermo, for the Community Development Block, block Grant Program Home Investment Par Partnership Program. Is there a motion for approval of that? So moved. And a second. Second. And any discussion? This is housekeeping, right? It is. It okay. makes us eligible with Election County if we decide we want to apply for a block grant in the future. Okay. Which we don't. That we have to qualify for. We don't. Right. We don't. Okay. Um, all in favor then of the approval of this inter intergovernmental agreement, do so with your hand. Is this is permanent or is this? Every year or every so many years? Yeah. Every year. Every year we have to approve it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you were in favor? Yes. Um, Next item is item C, approval of a five-year lease with statewide security systems for surveillance system for the community park in the amount of 89000 Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second for discussion. We could go home. <laughs> uh, any discussion? Uh, Ms. Yeah, Mr. Walker, Terry Healy, the, uh, the uh, vendor who put in the uh, bid is here, if you want sure. to ask him questions. Yeah, Mr. Sheely, thank you so much. Have you come up here? Thank you. We are um, put out this bid for the surveillance cameras, and initially we were looking at two or three or five, I think it was, from the initial uh, 
some positive proposals. And um, we're going to put them in strategic areas of the park. And again, the whole idea was not so much to garner a sense of this is going to be a big brother looking in on you, some more of a, a way to track or to be able to capture images so that we can monitor what's going on in the park. Right now, we have no way of doing that at all. Um, statewide security systems responded to the uh, proposal, and I understand they originally responded and said they would put 100 cameras in the park, which is way, way more than I had envisioned and at a you know a cost was significant and i said well sure i like more is better and 100 cameras in that park would have been fine but i don't think that that's a little overkill for what we, what i was envisioning initially i was just looking at you know being able to capture the people that are coming into the park uh during the night during the day any activities that go on in the amphitheater and the walking trails strategic areas in the park and and we, we would have to sit down with you at a later date if you know if we, if we pass this and, and say yeah these are the points we need to cover and these are the points that we need to monitor um, they came back with another proposal and said okay we can put 50 cameras uh, located on poles throughout the park and these these cameras would record 24-7 activity, and please tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, 24-7 they will record uh, video footage of what's people coming in the park, walking on the trail, any activity that goes on in these strategic areas, and if something should go down, we need to have a record or have to go back and figure out what happened. There's no question about it, we can go and retrieve this data from these, um, these cameras uh, at certain points and, and, and be able to play that back for the purposes of solving whatever problem that may have came up. Again, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a preventive aspirin to say that this will prevent things from happening. I merely see it as, a, as an extension of what we built out there is spending, you know, almost, what, $1.8 million on this park. The, the extension of we need to know what's going on all 24-7, whatever time of the day, whatever time of night, uh, who's coming in the park after hours. Even though the fence is up and it's closed, you can still walk in around the fence and go in there. It's not chain linked, it's not electrified, you know, but right now we can't tell you who's walking in the park after hours or before the officer gets there to unlock the gate. We can't tell you how many, whose cars are being brought in the park and being left. If we have a children's playground, we can't tell you what kids are being picked up and talked to by people. We can't tell you that. We just say that we have these facilities out there that's basically un, unattended. And hopefully nothing will happen that will cause us to have to have a video record of it, but I think by having this, we will. And the technology is such that at $1,000 a month, the technology is up to date. You're able to videotape in dark and evening hours 24-7. You're able to retrieve this data back whenever you need it. It's, I guess it's scrubbed after a year or so, or what? Or <clears throat> the, the boxes, there's four cameras, by the way, on each box. Mm -hmm. So when we say 52 cameras, we're really talking about 13 boxes spread out. Mm -hmm. So it's not like 50 cameras all over the park. That would mm -hmm. uh, be good, but that's, we don't need that. And these boxes, um, they record 24-7 all the time for 30 days, and then they automatically rewrite over it. You don't have to go out and do anything. Mm -hmm. If there's an incident, whatever it might be, if, Chief Buck wants us to check something out or we would go out. We would retrieve the video as part of our service and if maybe it was a car break in. We would make that video, give it to uh, the, the officer and we'd go to court and testify if we ever need to do that. These same boxes are the ones that are all over the city of Columbia. They're on every block on Main Street. They're in North Main Street, Columbia College. All the stuff in five points you hear about in cameras, these are the cameras. Um, we're presently installing 150 of them with the City of Columbia. Richland County, Orangeburg Police use them, Georgetown Police use them, so these other cities use them, Forest Acres use them in their parks. 
Um, in Orangeburg, I think of Edisto Gardens because they built some neat facilities there a while back, restrooms and stuff, and they put a couple of our boxes in the park um, near the restrooms. And within two weeks, some kids came in there and graffitied the bathrooms and buildings, and we had the face shots of everybody because of the way we installed everything. And the police, you know, arrested them. And this has happened even in Roy Lynch Park um, about a month ago, right in Elmwood. You had, it was on the news, you had some people having sex in the park in broad daylight. And we had all that, of course, on, on video from the box we had just put in there. And they arrested the people. So hopefully nothing happens. It's a beautiful park, and hopefully you never need any video for anything. I'm sure there's probably not anything happening there. But if it ever does, it's nice to have the video to go back and you know see. But it also, I, I always will throw this in, it also can prove people's innocence. It's not just finding out who did something. Many times we you know, we prove that somebody didn't do something. So that to me that's just as important. But the video is what it is, and um, 13 boxes spread out. I have a map here, and I just put 13 little blue dots on where I would recommend it's open to whatever, certainly two bucks, whatever you want. But um, I was when you first come in, when you pull in, there's a stop sign right there with a picnic area. So right there, catching every car coming in and out of there. And if they just kept on going, we'd still have that. But if they come in, I would have another box in the middle of the parking lot right there by the restroom, looking at the whole parking lot. Then in the restroom, when you turn left at the restrooms, there's, there's posts there, some six by six posts, four of them. I would have one box in the far corner, which would catch all the activity, people going around the restroom, going that way, down the steps, across the path. Um, another one would be in the picnic area. Um, you have four cameras around that. The playground, I would have three spread out. And then the amphitheater, um, if you're sitting up there looking at the stage, there's a huge beam across the top. I would have two cameras at the top there looking across the stage at the crowd, and then two behind it on the same beam looking at the parking lot on the side of the amphitheater. You get a lot of bang for your buck with that. Um, and then behind the amphitheater, you have the big rail behind, just one back there, in case anything happened there. Um, and then, of course, the uh, other entrance when you come in, when you first come to that back parking lot where you would turn to go to that parking lot, one right there, which catches anybody coming in. And then another one towards the right, if they went on down to the long back parking lot, something there. That's pretty spread out and you get a lot of bang for your buck there. But that's pretty much it. Do those, when you say they see them coming in, does it get their facial or just your driver's license? I mean, I mean not driver's license, but driver, the well, license. For, for example, let's say somebody comes into the park and goes to the picnic table and wanders all over the park from that point. Um, when they come in, we're going to see them, of course, come in. We're going to see them park. And when they get out of their car, if they go towards the restroom, we're going to have a face shot of them. If they go just go straight to the picnic table, we're going to have a face shot of them. If they cut through wherever they go, we're going to, wherever they walk in these main arteries, they're going to probably cross these boxes. And you get, to me, the reason we're so successful in helping law enforcement to figure out, because a lot of people have hoodies on and hats when they do things. The cameras are real high, looking down. You know, you can see them break into the car, but you know, that doesn't, you know, we need to see who did it and be able to prove who did it. And our camera levels are usually about seven feet off the ground. And that's how we get the face, what it takes to get the face shots. And you guys, uh, I believe it was in the contract that you, you will maintain them, you keep the technology up to date, which is one of the concerns that, you know, Mr. Hoots has pointed out to me. Technology changes on a daily basis, on especially in the cameras and telephones and all that kind of stuff. These cameras will be update, updated yearly, or if, if the technology changes next year, yeah. we don't have to worry about being outdated, having cameras that can't capture facial people at night because when technology has upgraded now. We can't get motion tech. I don't know. I'm just throwing this out. You will maintain the current technology level for capturing the images that we need to have. Yes, and okay. another way to say that is because we own maintain the system, we're responsible for making sure we got because if it doesn't work, you know, you're not going to want our service, obviously. Correct. And so all of it's going to go bad within five years. There's no mm -hmm. And we will be replacing every bit of it within five years at our expense. That's part of the deal. When we go to replace it, the cameras I'm using right this second, I didn't have last year. So you'll always, you know, 
get the latest applicable technology. You could always argue that you could spend $20 million and get better technology, but within reason, this is the stuff we use everywhere else. Right. And we, but that's, you're right, and I'm thinking we'll be keeping the latest technology as far as what's applicable to this. And, and the thousand dollars a month, I mean, we, how much are we getting from Palmetto Health for the amphitheater? Sorry. Is that 17? Oh, same thing, 12,000 a year. 12,000 a year? Okay. So the thousand dollars a month is a wash. That's kind of spending on the power. You could argue. I mean, it's a thousand dollars a month for power there, right? Twelve hundred. Yeah. It, it's is about thirteen hundred a month over there. So I mean, it's kind of gone too. Long. Because the lights stay on all the time. I mean, that's the big thing. Mm -hmm. well, we didn't um, put anything in the back. We didn't lights on the day for. Well, you know what I meant. All night. Oh. oh. <laughs> the park gets locked up, but the lights are still on. Right. Right. And, and the cameras will pick up night vision. Now, did you say we would get license plate number? No, I, did, I didn't say that. Um, but let me say this: and you, license tag camera. I get this asked this all the time. License tag cameras are license tag cameras. Now, I have gotten license tag numbers with the cameras we're talking about, but it's going to have to be, for example, when someone's leaving the picnic area. Stop signs right there. I've got a camera box right there, and it's going to be looking at that back of that car. If they're stopped in the daylight, basic shouldn't be any problem. Although I'm not saying it's a license tag camera, that's a situation we should be able to get a tag if they're sitting there. If they just fly through, it's not going to happen. Um, and you would need a license tag camera to capture that. But the main thing, usually, if something happened in the park, whatever it might be, to be able to document who came in, what they did, who they're with. Uh, and how, who they left with, how they left, is um, you know, very helpful to law enforcement to, to, to discern whatever's going, whatever happened. But uh, they're very, very effective. And one other thing about night vision, that's another term. Um, in total darkness, you're not going to see anything in total darkness. I mean, this is just not represented tr truly. I've walked around the park, it's, it's very well designed, lighting-wise. It's like somebody really put a lot of thought into that, and it looks good. Um, but if we, when we look at this, I'll give you samples of the video once we install this and let you see. So I want you to have a record of every camera angle we're using and you tweak it wherever it's applicable. But then also we'll look at it at night, day and night. In the daytime, they're going to be deadly, unbelievable. Nighttime, they're fine and decent light. Mm -hmm. if, if we're going to try to cover the very back walking trail and there's no light, we're going to be disappointed. Maybe we add a light there. Um, so if we need to add some light in any of this in the park, if you feel ne that's necessary, then that's okay. But I, I think we're okay with what you're trying to achieve here. But you're not going to see anything in total darkness. It's just not, but I don't think that park's really total dark, actually, either. No. 89000 is the total cost over five years? Uh, well, yeah, that sounds right. 26000 up front and then 1000 a month. Do we have right. a yeah, that's what it is. up front all cost? As far as if we didn't want to pay them monthly, we just want to pay it all at one time, is there a cost on that? I, I could, I could take certainly our money up front. Uh, give you that, but normally that's not what we do. Normally, this is what our service is normally. What? But, I thought um, we were bending out for that's the, Because if you buy something, it's going and these things are going to go back. Right. And you have to continue to buy. Yeah, I wouldn't want to pay it all up front. I mean, well, well I think that's yeah. what was discussed at, at the meeting was that they would give us lease and and purchase both, so we can make the option. Well, I thought we discussed not purchasing because of the technology change. That's the whole idea yeah. of leasing. I think we discussed both. Yeah. 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 It says yeah. in the minute we, that the RF for the discount. Yeah. RFB would be for leasing versus purchasing, so we could make that choice either one. This is cheaper than purchasing, right? This is a lot cheaper than, it's I, uh, a lot better than purchasing, because you're sure also getting the service. It's like leasing a car, yeah, exactly. it's a lot cheaper. Well, again, I want to keep well, up with the technology. I want to keep up. I don't want to buy something, again, with the phones, buy a telephone today, and then six months down the road is obsolete. Sure. So, so you have that plan. Go ahead. As I understand, yeah. the eighty-nine thousand. Would there be any discount on that if we paid it up front? But we would still get the updated technology as it uh, changed, would we not? Well, again, that pricing structure we gave you was based on a, a installation service setup fee, mm -hmm. and a monthly service fee, not only for the cameras replacing them, service them, but also for the service. If y'all call us every day to go out there and look for something. That's part of our service, not just buying equipment. It's, it's a service that comes with it that's very important also. Okay. 
but and I guess what I'm asking same thing Harvey if we want to pay up front all cash at one time sure. is there a better price is there a discount it's, it's going to be a lot more money than this for sure well I'm looking at eight threes and just theirs is less on the cash upfront basis as opposed to the lease I mean theirs is more altogether why would it be more if we paid for it up front I mean you'd have our money to be using for that five years. Yeah, and if you all wanted me to give you a purchase price. No, I didn't mean okay, that. I thought that's what you're asking. Uh, uh, just pay for the lease up front. Well, of course. Be very happy to pay that. Sorry, I missed some. Somebody hit me in the head. Buy it or lease it. Pay 89000 Give them a check for $89,000. To see five you in five hours. years. Right. No, but they usually get a discount if you're going to pay up front. Yeah. I'll make a motion for that. <laughs> no, that's fine. Either way, it doesn't matter. But yeah, I would have no problem with that. And as a matter of fact, if you did it that way, I do think you should get some kind of discount for paying five years up front. So I would say 5%. Uh, no question about that. Okay. I'm not in favor of that, but that's okay. <laughs> that's fine. Um, now, one thing I wanted to ask Councilman Walker, um, you said that if we do this, we can tell who's coming in the park, who's talking to kids. So we're going to have a facial recognition that tells who these people are, or we don't? Okay, it, it, I guess here's the way our system works. First of all, everything's in place recording everything we just discussed. Usually the way this works on all of our other systems everywhere else, you don't, you normally you wouldn't go checking it every day. But when you have an incident, somebody reported a suspicious person. It doesn't have to necessarily be a crime. Hey, we saw somebody suspicious walking through there, and they could file a police report or y'all, whoever wants to look into that. You would, we would go out there and look at that, find what it is, make a copy of that, give it to you, and if you can, you can do that every day if you want. So to answer your question, it's the main thing with us. The video is there. It's we've got what we need if something happens. That's the main first priority, and then. Hopefully you never need any video, but if you do, for whatever reason, we would bring you that video. That same day, by the way. Mm -hmm. And if it were FOI, we'd have to release it too, Bob? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. We would have to, if anybody asked for up to the last 30 days, because after that, they're already recorded over. Okay. I have this map where I marked the blue dots. Would you like me to leave that with somebody or take that? I think it's Bob. Yeah, I leave mean, it with Bob. Yeah. Bob. I mean, we can we'd adjust that map, right? You can do it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's very um, flexible. I think it covers what I understood that your main concern were. Mm -hmm. There's people coming in and out of the park, the picnic area. I grew you know, in the uh, amphitheater area. Um, people coming in and out of the back. Um, the, the, when I originally said 25 boxes, by the way, which is 100 cameras, all I was doing was covering those walking trails pretty thoroughly. Um, for example, when you go into Five Points, if anything happens, you're going to be on video. It's just that simple. And that's our first plan. So that's why I said that. it sounds like a lot. When you get down to it, it's... So it's, our video is going to look like what we see on TV when something happens in Five Points, right? Yeah, that's, that's the same video. Okay. I can say if it's the same video we use everywhere. It's okay. the same system. But I do appreciate you know your interest in, in everything, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you about it. And if you want to follow up with any in any way, please let me know, and I'd be more than happy to accommodate any requests. Um, Chief, uh, how many? incidents whatever have we had at the park as far as calls I know we've had two two um, okay so those are the only two if we had this video service would you use it if we had incidents there absolutely okay now I read in the Irmo news <laughs> a couple of months ago that if we had a murder in there you wouldn't be able to know who did it. Is that correct? That's a what do you mean? pretty open-ended hypothetical question. Yeah. But the comment was, if we had a murder in the park, we wouldn't know who did it. Is, I'm asking the police chief, is that correct? It's <laughs> hard to predict the future. <laughs> <laughs> if we had any murders in the town that we haven't... Our history is we've got to have an unsolved 
a homicide in the town of Berkeley. We've never had. We've never had a shooting down at five minutes. They were able to identify the guy who shot the girl down at five minutes. Yeah, Martha Childress, the girl who was there. Martha Childress, thank you. That's the film I saw. There's another example of our service. I mean, the police called me at probably, I'm guessing, 2.15 in the morning. We had somebody here within 15 minutes. And I'm right there, we're pulling the butt off the box of video, we're looking right at, they're looking at it just like I am. And was, I can't get into the details of that because there's a lot more going on there, but right. our video was critical for the whole situation. Exactly. She's but, back in school? Pardon? She started back to USC. Yes, she did. It's, it's, what, a, yeah. what a great, courageous young lady. But, yeah. um, but what is your, what's your point, Mayor? Are you saying that, that, that you won't be able to tell? No, I, my point is I think shot. we have a very fine police department that, as far as I know, we haven't had incidents in the park, and as far as the ones we've had in the rest of our community, they've resolved them pretty good. Wait a minute, you just, you just formed your mouth to say we never had incidents in the park? No, what I said, we're not going to argue. What, what, happened, what, happened, three, what, there, what that, happened three months ago? I said we never had any in there that we haven't been able to resolve, in the park or in the town. So we have no unsolved. Whatever. Yeah, you no just followed your mouth and said we never had incidents in the park. I mean, you want to play back the videotape? I mean, how in the world would you come out your mouth and say that when, when the whole idea is not to prevent incidents in the park, but at least have a record of what, who, what, where, and what, what happened? Well, you may and you may not. What do you mean you may and you may that, not? The guy says he can get caught. In some light, it wouldn't show up. In some instances, they got hoodies. He, he got just said he night. was able to solve the Martha Children's shooting from a video camera that they installed down at Five Points. And it may have been solved at night. Too. I believe that happened at night, right? It did. It did. Okay. I'm not trying to get into the detail of that shooting or that, that case. But if he was able to do that at night in Five Points with the, with the camera system that they had down there, we certainly would have the same technology in Irmo, South Carolina, in our brain community park. I think he's saying that we don't need it. Oh, well, let's say that it. then. They'll say well, that we never had an incident in the park. They, the lighting that we have in the park currently and where you have projected to place your camera boxes, in your professional opinion, do you feel like that would give us adequate and usable uh, renderings from the the video at night. I, I think it's adequate, but what's really going to help us know for sure of that, if we need to adjust any lighting for any reason, according to my opinion, somebody else's opinion, is look at it at night. You know, that's what I was told. I'd rather I want you to look at it. I want because you, you may say, well, you know, we understand you got this camera looking right over here by the amphitheater, but we really would rather have it over here. Well, you have final say so in any of this, but your existing lighting. Is we're gonna we have everything designed to work with that and laid it out so it takes advantage of that, but there might be differing opinions on whether that lighting is enough or not. Mm -hmm. it should be adequate. I mean, it's good. It's, you know, but again, other people may have a different opinion. That's why I want you to see it, and then we can decide if it needs more lighting. Then you can make appropriate um, additions. And where are you getting the power for your cameras? Okay. Well, we normally do everywhere else. For example, the amphitheater. For example. In the back of that beam there, you have a bunch of conduit going across of it. In the back right corner, we would have our box mounted there. The cameras would run into that, connect to that electricity right there. Um, I've got it laid out so everything's near, as close to, of course, as an electrical outlet. And in my uh, proposal, I said that the county used to uh, uh, supply five or six electrical connections, standard connections, um, to wherever we would need it. But it's always close by, with one exception. The playground is not, doesn't have anything real close by there. But, there's a, but there is a box about 100 feet away going towards the amphitheater, which has outlets on it, which I think you would pull it from there. That's the only long run, if you will. Everything else is very close by. Mm -hmm. Any more questions, comments, discussion? Well, I thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank all of you. Hope you'll have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. This one. Oh, right dear. Did they um, see each other? Y'all have any questions against yes. each other? Or oh, yes. 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 No, no. 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 You got any questions? Two, Unless you want to wait till the call gets back. I don't know, but don't ask me. Really. I mean, and is this something you think we need? Right.
Well, would sign off on it? Uh, well, don't answer that question, Yeah, Steve. I do. Don't I answer mean, that. We, we ask our, legal, we ask our uh, attorney all the time for stuff that's not legal. I'm asking him. He's not, I think. I, you know, if it's available, we absolutely will use it. Thank you. Um, I, you know. unlike, unlike our illustrious mayor here, I think that we need no, this difference. <laughs> illustrious <laughs> mayor. I think that the you know, citizens of Irmo has entrusted their faith in Barry Walker to say, you know, protect our assets. And in protecting our assets and protecting what we believe is a safe and, and beautiful community we have. If we can do this, and the cost is not a factor because we got $12,000 coming from Palmetto Health from a sign, and that $12,000 can be applied directly to the park's camera system. We got that for you know, to cost. It's not gonna bust our budget. We're gonna have information that we don't, right now we have nothing. We have, if something should go down in that park, we are at the mercy of Chief Spuck's investigative team's ability to find out what's going on. I want to give them. I want to give them as much ammunition as possible. And if I can give them a videotape, here's what happened in the playground. Here's what happened at the amphitheater. Here's who came in there. You know, use that in your investigative tool to solve any problem. And if that, and if that investigative tool says, if that, if that camera system says, you can come in our park and you can enjoy our facilities. But guess what? Smile, you're on candy camera. And you will get videotape if you decide you want to do something crazy. So, I mean, that's what we should do. And I think it is, again, it's not a situation where we're blowing our, you know, blowing smoke. I think we have nothing right now. And any perp or any person out there that knows that, and say, great, Irmo, thanks for building this beautiful uh, $1.8 million 14 acre park. You know, we're gonna go out there and have, you know, a rendezvous or, uh, I don't know, whatever they do bad parks <laughs> at night. <laughs> Our existing park, did we have that problem there? Yes, we do. <laughs> we did. <laughs> we did had we a situation. Have cameras over there? No. no, but we no. had the situation though. But the, and well, I'm the, talking about this park right over here. No, but park. that's that's too that's too visible. I think this park is a little out of the way. I, the one thing, because we're putting the chief on the spot, that's not fair. But oh, no, I, I said don't answer the chief on But uh, we don't I'm have the problem the Columbia, tonight. They do run it through their different departments. And yeah, I think so. Off on it, and they do it county too. And we don't have the problem today. Right. But we could easily have it in a couple of years. I mean, this is a five-year lease, and that's what I'm looking at. In two or three years, we don't know what's going to happen. Mm -mm. In the, mm -hmm. And I think this is a reasonable amount of money over five years. It's about, a, uh, don't, don't you? I think absolutely. Well, mm -hmm. We got the orchestra going to have 20,000 people. I think about 88% more than 1,050. <laughs> I'm just saying. I just like the number of cameras. That's the difference between the two. There's a number yeah. of actual cameras. 50 as opposed to what? Six? They were like 12, I think. 12. Okay. 12 or 16. 12 at one and 16 at the other. To me, have 50 opportunities of videoing. This is a lot better than me. Of course, there's one scenario. If we don't know something happened, we're not going to look at the video, you know. So, Barry, I think you need to stay and watch. You know, several nights. <laughs> Just well, I'll so be out there. Know. I'll be out there on the 26th of September, for sure. 26th and 27th of September, I'll be out there. I think it's a reasonable amount of money. Any more discussion? All in, all in favor of the five-year lease with statewide, well, is it five-year lease or is it the upfront or just the purchase? Five-year lease. Well, it's a five-year five lease, lease okay. but I mean, so they, they, they just said we get five percent discount if we pay them all up front. I don't think I we mean, ought to pay them all up front. I don't what either. What if they go out of business in three years? No. Yeah, exactly. No. We ought to pay them yearly or monthly. Huh? Or no, no, I don't think so. So it's approval of a five-year lease with statewide. I was just going to say if he was going to be crazy enough to go for 40%. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, if he'd knock off $20,000, that's different. But yeah. yeah. Um, so the approval of the five-year lease with statewide security in the amount of $89,000. Um, all in favor do so with show of hands. All opposed. Next item is presentation by citizens.
This is for anyone who wants to speak to council on anything, whether it's on the agenda or not, may do so at this time. All we ask is you give us your name and address for the record. My name is Ruby Miller, and I want to be very, very brief. It's very difficult for me to understand how my council people could have reservations about putting a camera in a park. That park I've been to. In this day and time, we live in a new era. Police officers need it only if, say, something happened. Something may not happen, but it lets people know we have cameras. Smile. Yeah. We have cameras, and with technology, Irmo is a quiet town. We have good police officers. They are very well respected. I don't think there are any people that have anything negative to say. They are very, very responsive. We should continue <coughs> to help these very fine officers. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Anyone else? Oh, good evening. Um, I have a proposal to make for my uh, for my cousin's um, the business that she wants to do an, uh, do an addition for, but it's uh, zoned for neighborhood commercial and not general commercial. But um, she wants to change it to general commercial, which will add on more business and more jobs for it. But um, apparently, it's been. I've been having ups and downs with it for the past two months. I would last ask the city council to help me with this. For one way North Royal Tower Road, it's a gas station um, plus a business. It already has beer and wine. I'd like to add a liquor store in there, which is 800 square feet, which would provide um, the neighborhood a walkable distance instead of going to Kroger and driving everywhere. I mean, because uh, right now it's zoned for neighborhood commercial, but right behind us, the it's zoned for um, general commercial which is a neighborhood which is completely pointless when I actually have business which is which has beer and wine um, I think if you guys could change the zoning for my um, neighborhood commercial to general commercial it would be uh, helpful in that's, behind the, him, that's the fire escape I have the map for the zoning too if you want to see it but right behind him is where the church is, is general it's, commercial. it's not a church it's a it's been a closed business it's a commercial building right now but it's, it's been zone? closed for one year. I don't think so, it's but I don't have it. General oh, okay. I don't have a map in front of me. I, I have it. If you want to see it. Show it to her, please. Yeah. Right here. That's us, and that's a commercial building right now. The whole neighborhood, which is basically neighborhood and woods, is marked for our general commercial. So that is us right there. Which I don't know. That's is neighborhood commercial right now. Yeah. That's the name of the Oh, um, yeah, I forgot the name of that. There's nothing Oh, that's the corner. No, I've been asking for procedures to the corner subdivision when they, before they built it, they that that's a residential subdivision. Not a but that right there, which is behind me, that's the neighbor. That's the well, the club building is supposed in this the other church over there. So the proper procedure would be to apply for a zoning change. Well, our zoning ordinance does not allow. That. Yes. You have yeah, in order to change that two, two acres or more, are you going to be contiguous with the zoning that you are requesting? And they need neither of those. Right. They came back and submitted something that was not that, to go before the zoning board as for a variance. Mr. Shuler reviewed that and decided that they can't, that's not a, that's not the procedure. What they had to do was come back and, and Ms. Lovelace and Mr. Brown have discussed it with the individuals that came to town hall, that they needed to fill out the, uh, uh, the uh, zoning of the ZBA variance form stating that they are objecting to her denial of the request. Okay. The zoning request. 
she spoke with numerous individuals a couple times about that and they have never come back in to follow that procedure okay did they did they submit the original variance request they did but it was not it was not done in the manner that it, it could it wasn't a, a proper request and mr Schuler, who is our planning consultant reviewed it and told them what they needed what told miss lovelace who passed that on to them what they needed to do to come back and ask for that request okay. which is See they that? are denying that they are they're appealing they're appealing the fact that it has been denied right and that, that appeal goes to the zoning that board goes or to the goes zoning council board. okay it right. doesn't go to council it goes to the zone right board. and it doesn't the, the yeah, thing is the zoning yeah. board is real specific no, on what criteria you have to oh. meet correct and, and for hardship right so um, they perceive you're producing a hardship on or they, they perceive you're producing a hardship on them for the use of their, their particular property in the way it's used right now and they want to submit the hardship letter back to the zoning board to say that you guys by denying your request quickly. you could produce some I've, I've submitted my hardship form and i've submitted what kind of hardships i've been having with the business Correct. with the with the form that i've submitted to miss lovelace but they they gave it back to i don't know you were not there with someone else i don't know if you're they gave it back to raza yes okay you, they gave it back uh, and i've spoken with them three times to let them know and she has too the procedure that they needed to do and then another gentleman took it back and said he'd have to review it and i, I think he's spoken with you also barry mm -hmm. and kathleen has spoken with, with yeah i called up and asked about back. the procedure yeah right. i mean they, okay so the procedure was that they needed to, the the proper procedure was that when they went to do that to check with the town to make sure it was properly zoned for a liquor store right, because the basic request for a rezoning we can't do it it's not it's not allowed in the zoning ordinance to rezone that property for that use so if i got a credit <coughs> but you can sell beer and wine but you can't sell liquor right. okay i have a question you guys are putting a liquor general commercial zoning in a neighborhood which is literally a neighborhood and there's woods right behind for it. a hard liquor sales that's correct yes but not you guys not beer and wine. But i already sell beer and wine beer and wine doesn't fall under the liquor liquor falls under DHEC and you know the state health the licenses you require to have from sled and DHEC what if I already have all the licenses you don't need you don't have licenses for beer and wine not required so if I get this correct so I can follow uh, if somebody wants to change your zoning they either had to be, the same they either had to be contiguous or with they the have to have two acres. They are requesting, yeah. or their property has to be over two acres. Two acres. Right. They don't. They so do the only thing they can do is ask for a ZBA. They can ask for that, and the variance well, is by the property. Not the was, requirement. Not was, but they, they said they had their. I mean, yeah. the paper so, was still there. So they haven't met that according to the variance thing. Correct. So now they've got to appeal that. They well, if they buy the property next to them, they'll have more to it. Paperwork, and we really aren't supposed to That's correct. be telling Very. them they have redo they could do that. paperwork. But no one told us that. Could. Yes, they, they have. They've I, been they telling you on and off for the past two Brown. months now. Haven't yeah. they told? I've been out there. Okay, hey, check this out. The solution is you need to buy the property next to you. <laughs> you give me more than two acres, and then you no problem. You can make the request. Or behind. Or behind it, right. Because you'll have more than two acres. Well, or the car wash next door. Or the car wash. The car wash is for sale. But you make the request, and that doesn't mean it's going to be correct. Yes, please. Right. Uh, if you give me the multi district park I can't envision, I mean, it would stagger me if anybody ever goes to change that to different parts. So even if you bought two acres, that does not mean. It's not a guarantee. That's correct. The problem is he apparently has a very difficult time understanding the procedure. You should either come into town hall and talk to Bob um, and get to where he understands it, or he needs to basically hire somebody to help him walk through the Right now they have to appeal the but they, they, but they, some, I, they I can't they have an attorney with them. but they can't they can't appeal it because they're not accepting the appeal they used no, to that they rejected the appeal they would appeal the zoning they would, the only appeal they actually would have 
would be the appeal from the decision of the zoning administrator. Correct. They Correct. cannot basically file a appeal. Right. Well, uh, that 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 decision has been made, and there's an appellate process. All we got to do is file the appeal. It goes to ZBA, and then ZBA will tell them the zoning administrator was right. Uh, then they're going to be right back at square one where they're frustrated. What they don't understand is that, that, that under the present state of the law, they're not going to be able to put the liquor store. They don't like that either, so they don't want to understand. Um, well, Jake, the main problem is, yeah, the first time I even knew they were doing that, and I talked to Roz, they had already subdivided it and put up the windows and the doors, and I said, what are you doing? When I went in there, and she said, well, we're putting in a liquor store, and I said, you got your permit? Well, she said yes. Well, she hadn't got her permit from the town, she went and started at a different level. Instead of starting at the town, she started at the DHEC and the sled level. That, that's where the problem was, because you had to get our permission first. That's fine. I mean, uh, it is what it is. I mean, I'm just making sure that they have an opportunity to express their desire or their, you know, their understanding that they're not happy with the decision from the administrator and wanted to appeal it, that the appeal was accepted. And if it wasn't accepted, they needed to have it accepted. And then go from there. But so it was accepted. The appeal, the, the, the request that they had put the appeal in, it was, it was rejected. It had been turned in. No, it was turned in, and Mr. Mm -hmm. Schuler reviewed it, but it wasn't the proper way to... But that's the ZBA accept. application. Correct. Correct. That's not the appeal of that denial. No. So what Mr. Schuler told them and Kathleen, they, to give that back to them, that was not the proper... Because the ZBA couldn't even see it, look at that. It was that wasn't... You couldn't do it. So she explained to them they would have, and she really, what even Wayne said that he wasn't, she shouldn't be telling them how to fill it out. But in essence, it was they would, they are appealing the decision to deny their request for general commercial zoning. Correct. For the property. Right. Because they don't meet any of those requirements. All right. Okay. So. So but they have never. She's met with them twice and told them what they needed to do and they have not come back to town hall to do that. Okay, then y'all need to do that. Y'all need to submit a request that says you are appealing the zoning denial, the request for change, zoning change denial. And then when they were, if they reject it, I don't know what they're gonna do, does the ZBA do? Then you go to the next step, but you have to do that first step. Right. right. Is that to go to town hall, get the, the zoning appeal form, and then submit it? No, 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 you already got that, right? You already got no, it back. They, well, they, I don't know. I, oh, she only gave us was, a variance form. And that's it. That that was the variance form, and they came in the last right. time. And I, I, I don't know that if you were there, but the, there were three people, and then there was a gentleman that I, they appeared to be maybe their lawyer. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm just saying, you have, to, you have to submit the paperwork. You haven't done that. They have not done that. They're saying that you have not done that. The it wasn't filled out right. It wasn't filled out right. right. What I'm saying is you need to fill out the paperwork and submit it. And if they reject it again, now you got something to go back to. Um, all you've done is ask for the zoning variance, and they're saying it's not been done right. Because it's this form is what you're talking about? Can you see out, Kathleen? I can't. Not something I can't see for I can't see too soon. I didn't want to waste his time because the appeal is going to come to the ZB and they're going to say, well, what does our zoning allow? It has to be the zoning appeal that you have to have filled out. It has to be filled out in another way. That you are appealing the fact that you were denied general commercial zoning. You were denying, you were appealing the fact that the, the, the request was denied for rezoning of your property. So this is the form, but I have to fill in a different form. You have to fill out a new form, because that is not correct. Come back to town hall, fill it out. You've already paid your money. I mean, we, we would want to give it back, and nobody's come back to get the check. So the payment has already been made. If you come fill the form out, then it'll be sent to the ZBA for their um, review. Okay. But we tried to explain to you, we, we, you know, you have every right to appeal, but we really don't want to waste your time either because the ZBA is going to look at our zoning ordinance and see that you just don't meet the criteria. 
to get the zoning changed. And, and Bob, I think he understands that, but let, let the ZBA make that decision so the man can have some ammunition or some information to go back to his his legal route to have it. He, Don't just tell him that and then he just gets not even accept the, the form from him. That's what he's, I think that's what he's getting frustrated at. You're not even accepting the form because it wasn't filled out correctly. Or well, I haven't seen the form yet. First time I when I, first time when I was given the form, Ms. Lovelace did not even look at it. She did not even look at Roz's form. She did this and then she threw, she threw the paper back at Roz. The first time. I've been going on to the office. That's fine. So let's, 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 let's eliminate that. Let's accept the form. Again, let's form. look at it. Let's go to the... Know, is the one boys going to prove? They, they, they have been. They, they, she's been. She's told them that this is twice that they've come to town hall that, that she has tried to help them to let them know. I was up there trying to explain it to yeah, her. Yeah, but let them let them submit it that's again. That's fine, but he's, he's saying that we, we weren't accepting it, but that's not been the case. Well, let's accept it again. And let's accept it, let, let the ZBA look at it, and then send it back to them and reject it, or whatever they do. I'm not saying they're going to reject it, but whatever their decision is with ZBA. At least, at least they, we have taken the information in, took their money, She's given that submitted to it they to haven't them. submitted it back to us. Okay. okay. But I'm saying this is the first I've heard that they haven't. Okay. Well, let's 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 make sure that let's let's make sure that it's, that we accept the paperwork in the correct form that he's going to ask for. You're appealing the decision from the zoning administrator. administrator. You're appealing the decision. Everything being writing. Correct. Right. And then we give it to the zoning. When we accept it, whatever fees you have to accept, take those two. Okay. We accept it. Give it to them. Let them do what they do and then give the decision back to them. If they're still not happy with the decision after that, then they got the right to go to the next level, which is to get Jake Moore's cousin over across the street and have him go and fight it out. You know, but that's the correct way to do it. At least they're taking the information in and let them process it. That's what I'm thinking the frustration is coming in because he's saying that you're not even accepting it. You're not even letting us put it in. Put it in. Let, take it from them. Let them put it in. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to address uh, council? Seeing none, um, executive session unknown. Nothing. Um, next item is adjournment. Is yeah, well, I got, I got a point to make. Why, why do we keep uh, canceling meetings all over the place? I mean, Just I enjoy, I enjoy getting together with y'all and having these. Which means spirited discussions every oh. every twice a month. <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, and I know, but we we miss well, how many meetings we had this summer? Two since Fourth of July. Oh no, we traditionally cancel three meetings. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it we seems like every, we turn around every week. We were canceling so meetings because of uh, yeah. holiday. Yeah. I, I like to get together and have yeah. these spirited yeah. discussions yeah. with Put my council. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> every once in a while, it's you miss the illustrious time. mayor. Yeah, I miss the illustrious mayor. I mean, come on now. I make the motion we adjourn. Yeah, quickly. Second. Uh, yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye.